All right, fine. Uh, Ab, thank you very much for coming all this way across bodies of water, not quite as far as Alexis, but nevertheless far in the Middle East. And we're delighted to have somebody who's talking to us about Zoroastrians. So fire away. Well, thanks very much. Um, I noticed yesterday some of you don't like general stories, but really like very detailed work. Uh, I, I specialize in very, very, very general stuff. So uh, you'll be very disappointed. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, the study of Iranian religions in general, and of Zoroastrianism in particular, seems to have entered a period of stagnation in the final decades of the 20th century that continues to the present. Since there is no historiography of the field, the reasons for its current disintegration are anyone's guess. Most scholars will be quick to point out the weak and still weakening institutional setting of Iranian studies in those countries with a strong academic tradition in the humanities the almost total dissolution of the study of Zoroastrianism among the Parsis and in India more generally, and the economic, cultural, and academic boycott um, isolation of the Islamic Republic of Iran, which has all but severed previously existing ties with a rich tradition of historical scholarship. Now, it would be pointless to deny that these aspects make themselves felt, but some of them should be seen as the result rather than as the root causes of the current problems. There are, I think, for all of us, um, two enduring problems that should be addressed here, both of which can be traced back at least to the 19th century. The first is the interpretation of the Arab conquests of Iran in the 7th century as a watershed moment in Iranian history that would make it possible and has made it possible to divide the study of Iran and of Iranian languages over two very different groups of scholars who most often do not find themselves in the same academic departments and generally do not seem to interact with each other at all. So it is not uncommon to find specialists in pre-Islamic Iran, in so-called pre-Islamic Iran, who neither speak nor read Persian, who have never visited Iran, and who would, when you ask them, who would list as their academic peers, Indologists, Indo-Europeanists, archaeologists, and ancient historians, long before they would ever reach their colleagues who work on Persian. Similarly, those who work on Iranian history and culture after the Arab conquest, all of you, um, you have been taught to approach anything Iranian through the lens of Iran's participation in the wider Muslim world. This has led to a trivialization of earlier aspects of um, Iranian culture, which shows itself especially in the use of little words like, of little words like still or even uh, when Zoroastrianism is discussed in a post Sasanian context. You know, said, there are even some Zoroastrians. Uh, there are even still some Zoroastrians left. Um, so these words turn the presence of Zoroastrians in the Iranian world into something startling, but predictably fugitive, uh, that ruins the general picture rather than something that highlights the complexity of Iranian history and its exceptional role in the history of Islam and of Islamic culture. So in this way, I believe this is the general thing I would like to say. What is essentially a religious narrative, the Islamization of Iran, has crept into the foundations of the academic study of Iranian culture and history. And academic fields in general do not thrive on religious foundations, and Iranian studies are not an exception. And this is especially visible in the second problem in the study of Zoroastrianism, the persistence of a view of religious traditions that is essentially conditioned and produced by liberal Protestant Christianity. Um, this has widely been recognized as having caused a systemic crisis in the study of religion. Religions, in general, or at least those religions that are de deemed worth studying as a separate entity, it's a very small select number, rather than as representatives of a type of religion. Religions are usually represented and thought of in, in, uh, in propositional terms. What do they teach? What do they believe? Um, uh, Etc. So coupled to this is the notion that these religions are somehow acquired by their believers uh, through a conscious choice. Um, that a, um, the believers, who are then known as followers or adherents, usually followers, that believers know what they believe, that they really believe it, uh, and that the continuation of this sincere belief is the chief motor of feelings of belonging to a particular religion. It's very obvious to all of you now that I'm from Holland, where this is the, the sort of the dominant normative model of religion. Now this approach to religion and this approach alone enables scholars to think of a religion like Zoroastrianism as a religion that can be represented as a, as a religion with a very long history, first of all, uh, from the days of Zarathustra to the present, and as a religion that can be represented in terms of an orthodox textual and ritual core, um, um, which enables us to recognize, to measure, and to explain uh, more or less variations uh, 
but this explanation then automatically becomes one in terms of deviance, right? So they misunderstood uh, what they were supposed to have believed. And it is this representation of Zoroastrianism or any other religion, but in my case of Zoroastrianism, that has caused many of the problems. Now, scholars have long been aware of the fact that something was wrong in the study of Iranian religions. Uh, but it seems to have been more rewarding professionally to register some of the problems and then continue work as if they were not serious enough to warrant more fundamental reflection on what it is exactly that we are doing. Uh, all of this, ladies and gentlemen, to convey the simple message that I'm very happy to be here today uh, for this splendid workshop in the, in the, in the lion's den of all you is Islamic uh, specialists. So what separates uh, specialists in Zoroastrian Middle Persian or Pahlavi from Persianists is not so much language, but rather script and possibly genre. Of course, Middle Persian and New Persian are really two different languages with different verbal systems. Uh, but as far as we know, they were never seen as such by Iranians, uh, by Iranians themselves at the relevant period when they were used simultaneously. They were seen, seen basically as two different ways of writing. Uh, there is obviously very little information on what people thought about language and script, and what information we have is quite dramatically tainted by all kinds of religious or ideological presuppositions, right? The 10th century polymath Hamza al-Isfahani uh, famously juxtaposes the fact that Arabic comes in one variety alone um, to the seven different varieties, all of them unknown, uh, we have to be honest, of Persian which in this case clearly means Middle Persian. Now, you, can, you can frame this in different ways. Either he wants to sort of show the unity of, of Arabic as opposed to against the diversity of Persian. He wants to highlight the richness of it. I mean, we don't know yet, but it's, it's clearly not a... I mean, it is based on the obviously wrong statement that there's only one type of Arabic script. Um, um, uh, Zoroastrians enjoyed telling each other that writing was invented by the devil. Um, uh, and the 9th century bishop Ishodad of Merv is well known for his expression of utter amazement over the Persian writing system, since the Persians, he says, write in Aramaic but read in Persian. Once again, a clear indication of Middle Persian, of the Middle Persian writing system. And indeed, anyone who has ever tried to learn Middle Persian will happily believe that this writing system indeed was invented by the devil. Um, uh, but there are few to no indications that 9th or 10th century authors believed the writing system of the Persians to be anything other than that. So it's a system of writing. Uh, linguistically, I think we can see that the Pahlavi script has been applied to write down New Persian as well as Middle Persian. And since it carries these very imperfect aspects of a very defective script uh, and the use of ideograms, uh, it can be read or it can be comprehended uh, without worrying too much about the underlying language. I mean, it seems to be one of those cases where people just read the text without actually sort of vocalizing it in a linguistic shape. So Iranians had a long history of doing this. Right? Um, in the distant past, their scribes had written official correspondence in Aramaic, but it rendered them on site in the local language. So they would have an Aramaic text in writing before them and would read it as if it were Bactrian or Soktian or, or, or Old Persian. And this is a talent that is still, but I'm relying on you, Hel, is still widely reported, and I only have anecdotal evidence for it, for contemporary Iranians who are said to, you know, to be able to read a Persian text as if it were a Kurdish text. So they have a Persian text before, and then they read the Kurdish version or a Persian text when they have an Arabic text in front of them. I can't do this. I can, I can't do this, do this in, 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 with, with any language, I don't think. So I believe as a point of departure of what I would like to think through with you today, we need to establish and basically spell out the complexity of, um, uh, la this is my, my abbreviation, language, script, communication, and identity uh, in uh, pre-Safavid Iran. And the initial situation shall, seems to be clear. Um, I shall be focusing on communities and practices defined by religion. Um, in this case, this is not just a matter of professional deformation. I am supposed to teach religion, but I also think for Sasanian, certainly for, certain, for Sasanian Iran, I'm sure, but I also think for early Islamic Iran, um, it is the only meaningful way of grouping the various communities living together. And there is a clear linkage between language or script and these religious communities that is going to be important for me for my presentation. Um, and I say language and script, as you can see here, uh, because in Sasanian Mesopotamia, um, it seems to be rather clear that script mattered much more than language. Um, Jews, Christians, Mandaeans, and Manichaeans all used roughly the same dialect of Aramaic. 
Uh, this seems to have meant very little to nothing to them um, um, for any construction of identity. So let's say what, what modern scholars do, and they do it all the time, is think in terms of indigenous peoples of Mesopotamia, and there are sort of Jews, Christians, Mandaeans, and Manichaeans, and then there are foreigners, Greeks, especially Persians, uh, and they use the fact that language behavior to support this. So the indigenous people would speak Aramaic, and the foreigners, they would speak, um, uh, they would speak Persian or Greek, and they didn't belong. Um, and this is n n nowhere, I mean, there's not a single text from the period itself that supports this assumption. Um, uh, um, so the fact that they spoke Aramaic, or that they used Aramaic, um, it, it, it never seems to have meant uh, very much to them. Um, nor did the fact that most Zoroastrians did not speak Aramaic but used Middle Persian or Parthian. So there is, uh, I already said this, there's not a shred of evidence for any linkage between the language used and a feeling of belonging, but script seems to have mattered. Um, so each community had its own writing system. When, when Manichaeism come in, comes into being, it devises its own writing system. So each community had its own alphabet, basically. And literature produced by Jews and Christians and Mandaeans, at least, can be recognized from a mile away. I mean, you, you, you know from a mile away if, if this is a Jewish or a Christian or a Mandaean text because it uses its own writing system. Uh, and in this, of course, in this sense, Persians also participated with yet another version of that alphabet. Now, most of these communities, um, and this is true um, uh, for Muslims as well, of course, use different languages to communicate with and speak about different categories of beings. Um, so they use a different language to speak about or with postulated beings, um, I don't know what you want to call them, gods, um, uh, um, spirits, ancestors, uh, and to communicate with each other. Um, Jews never gave up Hebrew and Aramaic as liturgical languages uh, and languages of scripture, even though Iranian Jews communicated among themselves in their own Jewish-Persian dialects. Um, Iranian Christians continue to use classical Syriac in their liturgy, but seem to have maintained the use of Syriac also for communication on more mundane matters. There are traces of somewhat larger Christian use of Persian, even in the liturgy, uh, but these are faint indeed, so that we can expect that, Christian, uh, that um, educated Persian Christians would communicate among themselves in Syriac, uh, with their neighbors in Persian or any other Iranian language and um, with higher officials in Arabic. Um, Zoroastrian reserved Vestan for the liturgy uh, and uh, made sense of this to them also mysterious language through a complicated system of hermeneutics based on the exegetical translation of the Avesta, the Zand, uh, which came in the vernacular, uh, which must have existed in multiple languages but which has only been preserved for us in Middle Persian. Muslims obviously used Arabic as the language of ritual and theology, but many of them must have continued to communicate with each other in local languages. For most communities, therefore, there were at least three different languages involved in process of communication. Um, one to address God or any other postulated being, one to address one's neighbor or one's family, and one to address persons in positions of power. And literary Persian sits in between all these categories in a certain way. So for most, it was not exactly the language they spoke. It was not exactly the language they would use in ritual contexts. It was not the young language they would use for contracts or in law courts. So it started, I believe, and this is where you all know more than me, as a language of culture. Uh, and as such, it remarkably and it gradually but unstoppably managed to marginalize Arabic or reduce its application to those areas of religion and scholarship in which it still is very strong in Iran. So Arabic, in other words, be began to be treated by Iranians as Iranian Jews treated Hebrew uh, and the Iranians or Austrians, Avestan and Middle Persian. Now, I promise to discuss with you today whether we can think of better reasons, basically, to explain why Zoroastrians began to produce a written literature in Persian, um, um, uh, um, and better explanations than strictly functional ones. So from now on, I'm going to focus on Zoroastrians alone, although we do need the example of Iranian Jews and their Judeo-Persian uh, literature um, to gain some depth. Zoroastrianism, as we know it, the, the religion that survives, is a late Sasanian version of a much older religion. Uh, and this late Sasanian version of the religion was massively supported and constructed by the Sasanian court uh, and the Sasanian state, which had basically relegated large areas of law and statehood to Zoroastrian priests. <laughs> 
They had built up a very complicated priestly hierarchy with an extensive textual repertoire uh, which could exist both in written and in oral form. Late Sasanian times also saw the slow transition from an oral to a written production of literary texts, uh, possibly beginning with a translation movement, famously including Kalile uh, um, uh, But in the case of literature and in the case of ritual, the connection with performance could never be wholly severed. So poetry continued to be sung chiefly rather than recited. And these traditions, the oral as well as the written ones, were obviously continued after the Arab conquests. The recently published archives from Tabaristan uh, prove that even the official legal role of Middle Persian in Pahlavi scripts continued well into the 8th century. And if we follow the rather meager dossier of epigraphy, we can see the ongoing use of Middle Persian right up to the 10th or 11th century, uh, even if, if, if the reading is correct among Christians. Uh, as you all know, the 9th century is an important one for Zoroastrian literature because it has yielded evidence for individual authors producing and recording the bulk of what has survived of Middle Persian literature. Of this literature, of Middle Persian literature, there is no history, nothing. I mean, we, we, there are lots of introductions, uh, lots of very useful sort of surveys of which texts are there, but there's nothing even, even, even resembling uh, a history. And in fact, the belief that the ninth century was the time in which all texts were written down has been a major handicap for any attempt to write such a history. It has obscured not only the fact that there are older texts, but it's especially obscured the fact that there are much more recent ones. But most scholars with an interest in these matters have spent most of their energy on attempts to recover from this corpus of texts Sasanian traditions even though it is clear that there is no acceptable method of doing this. It is just impossible. Um, so as a rule, interest seems to decrease with the suspicion that a text may be later than the ninth century or may not preserve such presumed Sasanian traditions. So the 10th and 11th centuries are therefore almost complete blanks in, these, in this history, um, even though we know um, that some texts are actually dated in this period. I mean, some texts were composed during this period, were composed in Middle Persian, and were sent out from Pars and from Baghdad um, to Zoroastrian communities all over the Iranian world in Middle Persian. And these indications, together with the epigraphic evidence, offer very firm support for the belief um, that Zoroastrians continue to rely on Middle, on Middle Persian, also in periods when the much more convenient Arabic script had long come to be used uh, to write down the language they actually spoke. And we don't know why. We don't know why they continued uh, to do this. Uh, and whenever this situation occurs, scholars are usually quick to point at the immense conservatism of Iranian culture. Um, uh, uh, this notion then is, is, is always simply assumed. Just, it, we're supposed to accept this um, as a matter of divine sort of reality. I mean, Iranians are deeply conservative. And I just don't believe in it uh, very much, uh, but if we have to believe in it, it fails to explain, obviously, why in the end Zoroastrian priests and lay people did switch to Persian, um, uh, so why they gave it up. There's little more we can do than guess, uh, but conservatism, if it was there, seems to have been trumped by considerations that can be described in two ways. You can either sort of go in for a very high religious formulation, or you can look at where the money is actually going. Um, knowledge of the Zand, um, and especially, um, I think this should be here, and, and knowledge of the Zand, and especially knowledge of the application of the Zand, so knowledge of the way how you are going to deal with this material to settle questions, was the foundation of the prestige of many priests. Um, it made them indispensable. It had also developed, or so Zoroastrians believed, into a dangerous tool when it was made available to those who were not priests. The Mazdakite movement was interpreted as evidence of how dangerous this could be. And following the extermination of the Mazdakites, uh, the teaching of Zan to lay Zoroastrians was forbidden. They were no longer allowed to sit in to listen to priests explaining the Zand to, to them. Um, and the concept, so this is one thing, and, and the second thing is the concept of having a dastvar, um, a modern Persian dastur, the concept of having someone, a person whose spiritual authority guarantees the validity of your ritual acts and whose decisions based on his knowledge of the zan were binding, greatly expanded. So we, we, we hear very little about it in earlier texts and suddenly it becomes very, very important. You cannot go to heaven unless you have a dastvar. 
um, in um, 13th century instructional literature, about which a little bit more later, this has been understandably translated not into a ban not on teaching Zand, um, it doesn't mention this, but it men mentions a ban on teaching Pahlavi. Um, interestingly, with this name. So the text is, you can sort of uh, li listen to the register of how uh, humble this kind of Persian is. Inke Mobadano Dasturano Radon Herbedam Ron Neshoyed Kehami Kasro Pahlavi Amuzand. Um, so priests are not allowed to teach Pahlavi to everyone, they're only allowed to teach it to their, own, to their own community. So you have a choice. You have a choice to believe that the priests who wrote this up were genuinely concerned about the possibility of heresy. Uh, or you can believe that they use this interpretation to protect their own financial well-being, and probably a little bit of both. Uh, in both cases, however, it is clear that the practical use of Pahlavi was at least partly not one of communication. Um, it was not never meant for easy communication. It was meant to restrict access. Um, and an incidental benefit to this situation only became apparent over time uh, when Pahlavi, as well as the Avestan script, uh, turned out to be a very convenient way of communicating with fellow Zoroastrians only. If you wanted to exclude Muslims, um, uh, you would write things in Pahlavi, individual words. And they are used in this way in the correspondence between the Parsi and the Irani um, Zoroastrians that started in the late 15th century. But I have to confess, this usage has been immensely overstated. It is much rarer than you would think. Um, it is actually quite rare. Uh, and the fact that the Pahlavi script was used to keep information from members of the own community has, as a result, been unduly understated. So it has been sort of heralded as this thing to exclude Muslims, whereas its chief function seems to have been to exclude fellow Zoroastrians. At a certain moment um, in time, um, however, Zoroastrians began to produce written texts in Persian. Um, texts that survived through the present seem to, su seem to suggest that this happened in the 13th century and that it involved two <coughs> quite, um, sorry, yeah, yeah, we need to go on to the next slide, that involved two quite different trajectories. The first rather limited one was the produ production of religious texts in poetry, so in the style and according to the conventions of classical Persian poetry. Uh, the best known example are the Zaratoshname of Keikos M. Khosro from the city of Rey and the poems of Zatosh Bahram and Pajdu. Um, the other, possibly more prominent trajectory for the community itself was the production of prose compendia uh, of Zoroastrian practices that came under the name of Sadar, a hundred gates or a hundred um, subject chapters. They were very influential and they have been much quoted in later texts. So the poetic trajectory thus sort of uh, adopted conventional, let's say standard classical Persian literary verse forms, but adapted them to subjects that had remained outside the main tradition of Persian classical literature. Um, the prose trajectory, by contrast, by and large continued in, as a matter of genre, the Pahlavi tradition, um, um, be it on a suitably humble level in order to be useful for practical teaching, but it switched script only. Um, right, so it's, it's, it's basic, essentially it is, is ordinary Persian, but the genre and the style um, continue that of Middle Persian literature. Um, Zoroastrian text thereby became readable, if you like, uh, to non-Zoroastrian Iranians. Um, but this cannot have been their primary function, um, and nor is it likely that they would have been read with great interest by ordinary Zoroastrians, because low levels of literacy and low levels of wealth and the production of manuscripts would have been in the way. So who were these texts for? And we don't, I mean, to give away the answer, we don't know, but we can sort of speculate about it a little bit. And what do they reveal about Zoroastrian participation in wider Iranian society? Well, this, is, this is, I think, the serious question. And to answer these questions, um, uh, we are going to make a small detour. I, I think I should go back. Can I, can I go back? Yes. Um, uh, to take a small detour. First, it's important to stress the last point. It's important to establish what these texts do not do, um, which is why you will all be, all be very disappointed. They do not reflect much or at all on issues of current concern. They do not, I mean, Zoroastrians never, uh, um, uh, ref Zoroastrian texts never reflect on the actual situation in which the communities find themselves. There is no Zoroastrian historiography, nothing, um, uh, which is perhaps one of the explanations for the notoriously difficult question why there are no Zoroastrian stories on martyrs, even though lots of Zoroastrians died for the religion. It never developed into a genre uh, as it did in, other, in the case of other uh, religious minorities. 
they do not reflect on contemporary issues in any other way than that sometimes they mention that nowadays, let's say in these days, uh, some of the rules that they would like to maintain have, been, have become impossible to keep. Especially true of the Rebayats, which are from the 15th century onwards, but otherwise they, they, they give this impression of existing in, in a timeless, contextless um, situation. So if you ignore a very small number of highly technical terms, moreover, linguistically they are not standard, they're not, um, they're not um, distinct from standard Persian. Um, you will read the opposite whenever you read about this type of literature. Much has been made of the supposed avoidance of Arabic terms, but it is simply untrue. Um, so it's either simply false or it's anachronistic. Uh, but if you especially read the Sadar, I mean, the, the Zand is called Tafsir, and um, the washings are called Ghusl. Um, when they, they mention the name of God, they say Ta'ala or Azawajalla or Tabarruk. Maybe it, it's just, I mean, it, ha it has been, it participates in, in standard Persian expressions. Now, the little detour I would like to make, uh, if I still have time, a little bit, it takes us to the Jewish Iranians. Um, there are important differences in later times. I'm not sure. I, I, I never worked as hard on um, Iranian Judaism as I should have in later times. So in post-Safavid times, in Safavid times, there are important differences between Jewish and Zoroastrian Iranians. So if you exaggerate a little bit, uh, you could say that Jews formed urban communities and Zoroastrians rural ones, um, that Jews were spread all over Iran. Um, and Zoroastrians withdrew into its centre. Uh, but this seems to apply especially to the period after the Turkish and Mongol invasions, in which demonstrably, I mean, we have the text to, to suggest that entire regional Jewish and Zoroastrian communities vanished I mean, and were impossible to sort of re-emerge. So Judeo-Persian literature, too, starts out in its full Jewish specificities, even up to the language, uh, in that the early Judeo-Persian documents, which were found in various Genizot and Cairo and the Crimea, as well as the recent finds from Afghanistan, um, they record the language that is actually spoken. So they are, they have been preserved in pure Persian, if they are Persian. Um, uh, so this is one thing, they, they are sort of very characteristic for the community. Um, 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 and you also see this in genre. So there's a production of tafsirs, um, uh, um, which would be called Pesharim uh, in Hebrew, and of Piyutim, so poetry, um, liturgical poetry, and there are some documentary texts. Um, uh, but from the 14th century onwards, Jewish poets began to compose poetry in Persian, um, following the tastes and styles of classical Persian literature. It's the same story as you could tell with the Zoroastrians, but with Jewish themes and subjects. Uh, unlike the Zoroastrians, however, Jews continue to write these poems in the Hebrew script. Um, uh, so it's not just the case that the average Muslim person would not be interested in reading about, I don't know, Queen Esther or a versification of Pirkei Avot, uh, but he or she would actually be unable to access them. Uh, Judeo-Persian literature, moreover, is much more diverse than Zoroastrian Persian literature. I think this has to do with the urban versus rural and the spread and the widespread. It's much more diverse. Um, there is some historiography, chiefly the narrative of the forced conversions of the Jews of Kashan um, from Safavid times. Uh, and it, um, 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 there is especially a lot of technical stuff, um, the, the things no one works on, um, evidently intended for practical use. So there are texts on medicine, on spells, on technology and similar, similar things. I mean, this is just there's a whole field out there. And there are very, very, very few people working on it because it seems to be not a wise career move. Um, uh, of course, Jewish. Well, um, we'll, we'll do this <laughs> over coffee. Of course, Jewish culture valued the art of reading, um, and theoretically required its male community members to be able to read the Hebrew script, a very easy script, moreover, to master. So Jewish texts offer clear evidence of what they were for. Um, right, they were intended for members of the community, which you can see because of the continuation of the Hebrew script, uh, and they are a clear sign also of participation in a Persianate cultural style by adapting the former, by imitating Fedosi, but then writing the story of Cyrus and, uh, and of Esther and uh, etc. Um, so it's 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 a, there are signs of participation on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, there are clear signs of remaining wholly distinctive within this broader cultural setting. And that could have been, theoretically, could have been the case with Pahlavi as well. I mean, Pahlavi could do, they could have done the same thing, or it, theoretically with the Western uh, script, which, which is easier to read because it records vowels and, and it's, it's less defective. 
uh, but it wasn't. Um, um, as far as we know, um, but it can certainly not apply to the prose standouts. So, um, uh, of these artoshname, it is absolutely clear that it highlights cultural participation, um, right? So, it's also it's a masnavi. Um, um, it, it follows Persian. Um, um, it has rhyme, which Middle Persian never does, uh, or only very rarely, and it, it has a sort of um, uh, Perso-Arabic meter. So, it's just very similar to classical Persian poetry. So it highlights participation. I mean, people sort of adapted these cultural norms. It is the most widely copied of all Persian Zoroastrian texts, chiefly in India, of course. Uh, and one can assume that literate community members would read it out loud to other Zoroastrians. It is actually also one of two texts that, that come with miniatures in some cases, the other one being the Adabi Raznamag. Uh, which is interesting because it has these hundreds and hundreds of paintings of the punishments of hell, uh, uh, which are very interesting. Um, Zartosh Nama is not only about the life of the prophet of the Zoroastrians, uh, but it contains a full translation as well of the, uh, of the apocalyptic visions found in the Zandi Bahman Yasht. So it also predicts the end, uh, which must have resonated strongly with 14th century Zoroastrians in central Iran. The Saddar texts, on the other hand, I think, um, uh, highlight. Um, so I, 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 this is. I'm notorious for doing this, going on and then failing to to um, uh, to go through the slides. Uh, the Sadar texts, I think, highlight the downfall uh, of priestly learning among the dwindling Zoroastrian communities of Iran. Um, and I'd like to spend my last minutes on this. So, as I said before, the setup of the Hussainian priesthood was mind-bogglingly complex uh, and especially costly. Um, uh, it was impossible to maintain, um, and, and I think this impossibility shows itself in the gradual abandonment of the situation that priests would know the Zand uh, and base their decisions on it. This happened very early, I think. I think it has already happened in the ninth century. Uh, instead, they began to produce and to use manuals or compendia of rules and cases. Um, um, and these form the backbone of the textual production of the ninth and later centuries, and one can easily see why. So they come in question-answer style, and they may partly be genuine community questions and answers by a very learned priest. That is certainly theoretically possible, but they developed into <coughs> manuals which priests would use uh, um, um, without having to go through the difficulty of consulting the Zand. So it is this type of literature that lives on in the prose Persian texts. Uh, and although they may have been meant for the instruction of the laity, um, I firmly believe that they would also be the first manuals Zoroastrian priests would consult when members of their flock came to them for counsel. Um, so I've spent all of my time, and then some probably. Uh, I hope you enjoyed thinking with me, uh, but I'm afraid it will not easily help the larger project to which it is supposed to contribute. We simply do not get to hear, really hear, the real voices of the real Zoroastrians of Iran. Um, what we hear are two things. So we hear we can figure out some attempts to match and to join up uh, the surrounding world and contribute to it. And on the other hand, we hear attempts to continue a religious life that is as unaffected by the surrounding world as possible. So as content, um, as voices, um, it may not amount to much, but I think sort of thinking with it may eventually come to mean a lot. Thank you very much for your patience. Very interesting. Yes, uh, take some questions here. Right. Has it a different time? Yeah, we're, we're, we're. Thank you for this very inspiring uh, uh, paper. I have a few questions. Uh, the first case is Tabaristan. You mentioned this. Uh, I think Tabaristan is a quite, quite unique and uh, uh, quite differing, different uh, issue uh, than the rest of Iran. So uh, the fact that, that Pahlavi is, is being used parallelly with Islamic uh, 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 script and the Arabic is more important than the usage of the Pahlavi itself. So mm. uh, the most striking evidence is the, uh, the uh, Imam Zodi Abdullah's inscription, which uses Arabic and Pahlavi. And, uh, and the dynasty uh, is the all above end, and these are uh, devote uh, twervershis. So how can a devotee dynasty use Pahlavi script in the early 11th century? So it's an untold story. Yeah. So I, I think there are na nativist original aspects, which are in a bit 
different from your conclusion. So in case of Tabaristan, it is a very, very unusual situation that an officially Muslim dynasty still continues using Pahlavi. In, in its, yeah, it, yeah. No, so I, though the evidence I, I, is rather scarce. Let's say the easy answer, of course, is that the, since we really, I mean, this was meant to be too, uh, seriously, since we really don't have a history mm -hmm. of sort of literary production, including Middle Persian, of, of the period of, of anything between the 7th and the 11th century, um, many of these questions will remain unanswered for the time being, I think. So yeah, it's likely that there were regional um, variations in the speed with which people sort of abandoned Middle Persian yes. for Arabic. Um, uh, let's say Sistan is an, another, is very early, is an, another very interesting case where you have these striking coins with the text of the Shahada in Middle Persian, it's one coin. That yes, is and there. Um, um, yes. so th there, there is some variation in how things developed over all the, all, over the various regions. There, there is evidence for Christians using Pahlavi as well, I think. Um, uh, my other question is about just yeah. one brief question. Yeah. My other is uh, the, uh, the story of Narsha here about the conversion of people of Bukhara, yeah. which is also interesting. But uh, the, their, their usage of Arabic is, is not recorded. So the, they started preaching in Persian in the mosques. And, yes. tried, uh, and, and it's also very interesting how Persian penetrates to Central Asia in the early Eastern period as, as a, yeah, quite a sacred language. To to sort of the, isn't sort of the role of Persian in the well, this is for you to answer, basically. But um, is it sort of generally believed that Persian was the language that brought Islam to Central Asia? Yeah, well, um, Narsha has an intriguing story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, people, uh, people in the mosques were instructed in Sogdian, but uh, the sacred, uh, the, okay, the sermon yeah, was yeah. in Persian. Yeah, and but, but let's say the Manichaeans do exactly that, of course. I mean, the Sogdian Manichaeans, even though Manichaeism was very, very clearly against liturgical languages, mm -hmm. at least originally, the Sokhli Manichaeans were the ones who copied these Middle Persian and Parthian texts and used them in their rituals. So mm -hmm. um, um, they, they did exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And one. Okay. Yeah, oh, uh, yeah? okay. Yeah. Okay. Later. You want to see? Oh, no one is. Okay. One, one quick one then. Uh, if you can expand a bit more about um, um, the Hebrew Persian or um, the script and the documents, because I, when I work in the British Library, there are, I think, over 100. Hebrew, uh, Persian uh, manuscripts. Text. Manuscripts, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, and it's, and some of them quite old, and nobody, yes. nobody looks at them. No. Um, and and as you said, probably also because of the present circumstances, there is not many people, or students, choosing that degrees in both well, Hebrew it, it, and I'm Persian. Sure it's due to still, the I think I've always been believed. I've, I've always believed um, that it is, it is just not because you will not be recognised as a, as a specialist in Jewish studies. And you will not be recognized as specialist in classical Persian literature. Do you think it's a career Persian thing? Persian is too Jewish, and for Jewish it's too Persian. Right. Um, so there, there have been, I mean, catalogues have been made mm -hmm. um, of the larger collections. But Judeo, Judeo Arabic attract a lot of attention. Yes, right? that's true. Um, but, 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 um, uh, Both Semitic languages. But I, yeah, perhaps, but also because the, the texts in Judeo Arabic um, um, can more easily be, be shown to be, in, to be important to people who work on Arabic philosophy and, and theology and other things. I mean, they have actually preserved, you know, um, 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 some of the important philosophical works. Yeah, but um, Al Hamiado didn't, for example. Sorry? Most of Al Hamiado, for example, literature no. is quite boring and still attracts some attention. So I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. No, so, but, um, uh, Susan wanted to say something about it. Uh, <laughs> no, I just wanted to say one that those Tabaristan monuments that you're talking about, yeah. those tombs, have been studied for the, the purpose of being uh, both a, a Pahlavi, Sasanian, and an Islamic yeah. local language. And it's, it's really important to look at them uh, as documents of that kind of survival of the memory, if, if I may put it that way. But what I wanted to uh, ask you was to think, actually, in this Judeo-Persian uh, comparison with the, the survival, if you will, in literary terms of the Zoroastrian literature, or the lack thereof, uh, is the interesting point about the fact that the Judeo-Persian side, or the Jewish side of the community, tends to be seen as completely the outsider to mm. that ancient history of Iran, if you, if you will, or going back to the pre-Islamic, whatever that means. And the Zoroastrian one, despite the fact that it remains unaffected by the larger cultural scene, is seen as that pure survivor, 
yeah, of that even, past. Even of course, the Jewish communities in Iran would, would, would and, and this is, seems to be part of Shahin Shirazi's message, right. uh, would say, we were here you know, in the time of Cyrus the Great. Right. Um, uh, they were the only ones who knew who Cyrus the Great were, was. Do you think um, this has something to do with script and language? I don't. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it would. I would say it has something to do with sort of being part of this society and yet being being distinct. Um, that would be valid for both. But I'm. I say the difficult thing really is in the ninth century, um, and, and I had to learn this the hard way because I made a, a horrible mistake in a previous uh, conference and Sarah Bowen Seven was, was there and she corrected me. I think it's very hard to figure out what Iranian identity means in the 9th century and the 10th century because mm -hmm. it is never mentioned. Um, um, right, so the only ones who continue to call themselves Ir uh, are the Zoroastrians mm. and, and at that moment I think Ir clearly means Zoroastrian. Mm. Um, um, and, um, so, so it, it, it's, it's hard, I mean, let's say, since there's no one, well, it's not just that there's no one who works on Judeo-Persian, there's no one who works on Zoroastrianism after right. the Arab Conquest or after the ninth century either. Um, so there's a lot of things that we just, we simply don't know. Um, I think the useful thing for, for people who work on, sort of, uh, on, uh, on, on Islamic Iran is that I think these small communities show how much is not mentioned in um, in um, Arabic and Persian texts. I mean, the, the, the most extreme example are the Mandaeans in southern Iraq, who are never. I mean, they've always been. They've never, never mentioned. I mean, if they hadn't survived, we would never have known they were there. There is literature on the on the Jewish community in the Safavid period, yeah. of course, yeah, fairly yeah, worked yeah, on. Yeah. So I mean, you but mentioned one text. And, yeah, the last one, ten seconds. Yeah. There we go. Nine, eight. <laughs> um, uh, what do you think about the reasons of the Zara? So, so you mentioned that the fact that the Jewish literature, Jewish Judaism is much richer, uh, richer than the Zoroastrian. I think it is because of the social status. Well, I, th I think, yeah, probably. And it others, depends on how you want to frame it. I think it's because the, the Jews really were in all Iranian cities, and the Zoroastrians really, and at a certain moment, had withdrawn into this sort of central desert. And perhaps, perhaps I think maybe there's another reason the, uh, that the status of script in their own culture. Yeah, yeah I think. And that orality that, plays a much wider role in Zoroastrian uh, traditions than, yes, than scripts. Yeah. And then in Jewish traditions. Certainly. Okay, that's true. Fascinating. Thank you very much. We're going to